Welcome to God's house for worship. Welcome also to those of you who may be joining us online today. Uh, Today, as we are continuing this series, this Easter series, Because Jesus Lives, we see that because Jesus lives, we have a new way of life in his name. If you can take a moment to please locate one of those green connection cards, you'll find them on either end of the pew that you're sitting in. Uh, If you wouldn't mind filling that out as completely as possible and putting that into the offering plate as that comes around later on during the service, we would appreciate that. Other than that, just go ahead and take a moment to greet those who are worshiping with you today. All right, then we will begin with our first hymn, Hail, O Once Despised Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven. 
I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first scripture lesson this morning uh, from the book of Acts is really a continuation of uh, a lesson that we read last week, continuation of Peter's sermon to the crowds on Pentecost. Um, And and these people that were gathered around them had throughout their lives believed that the, the way to God and the way to eternal life was something that ran through God's law. Peter, though, now points them to a new way, the way of repentance, repentance of sins in the name and in the blood of Jesus. We read, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is God's word. At this time, I'll invite the children forward for their children's message. Good morning. Have any of you ever read this book? Have you ever read this book? Yeah, a couple of you. What's it called? 
Fox and Socks, yeah. So this is Fox and Socks. Um, and Fox and Socks is a, a book that um, has a lot of tongue twisters in it. You know what a tongue twister is? Yeah, they're, they're hard to say together because maybe they have similar sorts of sounds or patterns and things like that, but they're not quite the same, right? So we've got these tongue twisters and fox and socks. Um, and I've kind of taken it upon myself as sort of like a, a little challenge that I, I want to I be able to read this book from start to finish without messing up a single time, without even having to like stop and pause and like figure out what comes next but just to do the whole thing perfectly, okay? How well do you think that I can do Fox and Socks? Pretty well. I, I got to say, I'm, I'm getting pretty good at it. Um, do you think I can do it perfectly yet? No. Nope. And I'll tell you what, there is one page especially that even if I make it all the way to this point, I still can't quite do it, okay? And I'm going to read from page 47, Fox and Socks. <clears throat> Try to say this, Mr. Knox, please. Through three cheese trees, through three, 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 I, I've already messed up. I just, this page, this page, I can't do it. Now, if I mess up Fox and Socks, are there any major consequences for that? Do I get in trouble? Do I go to prison? No, I, nothing like that, right? My wife might make fun of me a little bit because she knows that I'm really trying hard to do it all the way through, but that's it, right? No major consequences. But when it comes to God's laws for us, all those rules that we find in the Bible, I got to say, there's a lot more that's a lot harder to do even then reading Fox and Socks without messing up. How well do we keep all of God's laws and God's rules? How well? Uh. Do you do it perfectly? No. We don't do it perfectly. Not even close, do we? We mess up. Even when we try really, really hard and we think, I'm doing pretty good. Well, we're still not doing it the way that God tells his people to do it. Now, when I mess up Fox and Socks, there aren't any big consequences. When I disobey God, are there consequences? There are. There are major consequences for that, right? God calls us to be holy, to be perfect. And when I'm not perfect, there are problems with that. God says that we don't deserve him. We don't deserve to be with him forever because of that. But that's okay. You know why? Because he sent his one and only son. Did Jesus ever mess up? He didn't, did he? Jesus lived that perfect life and then he died on the cross. And there on the cross, he takes away all of our imperfections, all the times that we have sinned and disobeyed. He takes those away onto himself. And what does he give us? He gives us his own perfect life as our own. And because we now have that perfect life of Jesus, you know what it means? It means that we do get to be with God, that God is with us even now and that we get to be with him forever in heaven. That is an amazing thing that God has given us. So let's fold our hands and say a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be the son that we could not be. We are sorry for our sins and we thank you that we have Jesus' perfection now to call our own. And we look forward to the day that we get to spend eternity with you in heaven. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for coming on up. You can head back to your seats. We'll continue with our verse of the day, Luke 24, verse 32. Alleluia, alleluia. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Alleluia.
In our gospel lesson today, um, Jesus meets with a, a few of his followers as they are traveling on a road between Jerusalem and a town called Emmaus. Uh, now, these were people who had thought Jesus was going to be their way of life, and yet they still had some, some deep misunderstandings, even there on Easter morning, about who the Messiah w- was meant to be. And so as Jesus spoke with them, he pointed out that there was, in fact, a much better fulfillment that came through his death and resurrection, and that they could cling to this now with joy. Since this is a record of our Savior's words and works, please stand if you are able out of respect for this gospel from Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them, assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated as we continue with our next hymn.
If you were going to pick three words, three adjectives to describe yourself, what three words would you choose? If you've got a pen handy, you can even take a moment to write those words down, maybe in the margins of your service folder somewhere. Or at least, if you don't have a pen, take a few moments and kind of think through it up here. Remember them. I'm going to give you a few moments of utter silence right now to write those things down, okay? Now, maybe some of you wrote down or or thought a word like uh, adventurous to describe yourself. Like maybe you love to travel, you like to experience and try new things. Maybe some of you wrote down that you're compassionate, like you really care about the people around you. Or maybe you wrote down that you're creative, like you've got a flair for the artistic and you find all kinds of different ways to express that. Perhaps you wrote down that you're punctual. You really, really care about being on time. And if you do, you probably really care about other people being on time for you as well. Maybe some of you wrote down that you're religious. Like, you care about the things of God and you care about your relationship with him. Whatever those words are that you wrote down, though, um, they probably describe what you see as a way of life for yourself or at the very least an ideal that you strive to live up to day in and day out, right? Well, let me ask, um, did any of you in describing yourself write down or or think the word holy? Raise your hand if you did. Now, just in case you're ever tempted to someday, I have to forewarn you that if you go around telling everybody that you're holy, um, that's a, a quick way to lose friends and alienate people around you probably. Um, when we even call somebody else holy, that's not usually a compliment, right? Usually it's, it's part of a put down, right? Oh, they, they're so holier than thou. She thinks she's so holy and better than everybody else. And yet that word holy is right at the epicenter of everything that we are going to be talking about and learning from God's word this morning. And not just in some kind of detached sense or even just ascribing that word holy to God. We're actually going to see that that word holy is something that God assigns to you and to me as a way of life. Now, this letter that we are going to be reading some verses from this morning, First Peter, uh, was written to a group of mixed Jewish and Gentile Christians who were undergoing some fairly serious persecutions under the hands of the Roman Empire. And there might have been a very real temptation under the pressures that they faced to kind of just melt back in with the rest of the world, right? In order to avoid the suffering, let's not let our light shine as God's children. We can just look like the rest of the people around us and be fine. But Peter, as he is writing this letter, reminds them, and in these verses reminds us that we possess a new way of life and come what may, it's a way of life far better and far more glorious than any other. So we're going to start out today at chapter 1, verse 13. As Peter writes, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now, I think that sometimes Christians like you and me actually have a a misunderstanding that God's law and all of those rules that he gives us in Scripture do not have a way of life and a way to God through them. That's technically incorrect, though. There is a way to God and to eternal life through the law, and it's what we find right here in this little phrase, be holy. Peter here 
is quoting a passage from way early on in the Bible, Leviticus 19, verse 2. And in doing so, he's demonstrating that God's standards for you and me really have not changed one tiny little bit. You see, really, there is only one rule. Follow that one rule, and you obey all the rules, and you retain your status as God's children. Break that rule, and you have broken the rules, and you lose your status as God's children. That's really what brings us to our first key point this morning. What's the way of life through God's law? It's simple. Be holy. And maybe it's worth it for us to define our terms for a moment today. When we look at what it means to be holy in all these different passages of Scripture, here's the the definition, at least the the working definition that we're going to use this morning. As far as being holy relates to you and me, here's what that means. To be holy means to be fixed on all God's glory and all God's will all the time with all of yourself. And that's the kind of high standard that Jesus himself upheld in a conversation that he had in Luke 10. And we're going to read just a few verses of that conversation now. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. Do this, be holy in this way, love God like that, and eternal life will be yours. But can I ask again, how many of you describe yourselves as holy? today? It's such a simple concept, isn't it? One that's a whole lot less than simple in practice. Especially when we consider the fact that God isn't only talking about holiness in my hands and my feet and my body, but that he's also concerned about holiness in the words that come out of my mouth. And even deeper than that, not just the words that come out of my mouth, but all of those thoughts in my head, many of which never translate into words. And even deeper than that, that God wants there to not even be a single evil desire in the attitudes of my heart all the time. (laughs) Now, when we see this standard that's set, And when we realize that we have not lived up to it, this is where everybody kind of by nature goes off in one of two directions, okay? There is one group that will see their failure and say, I just need to throw in the towel, right? Might as well eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow I'm going to hell. Then there's another group, what's probably a much, much larger group, which instead tries to kind of redefine the terms, redefine those standards to say, well, what God says when he tells me to be, what God means when he tells me to be holy must just be that he wants me to be holy enough for him. But I got to tell you, there's a big, big, big problem with that. Maybe I can use an anecdote from my teaching days to help illustrate. Um, You see, in my five years of teaching high school, I don't think that I ever gave anybody a 100% on a paper that they wrote for me. Not even the student that uh, received a full ride to Harvard. At best, I think he only ever got a 99. And that's because, in my mind, a 100% means that it is perfect. And so if there was even one misplaced apostrophe or dangling participle, it wasn't perfect and at best could only receive a 99. You see, I was trying to impress something into my students. Almost perfect ain't perfect. And almost holy isn't holy. And that means that there is no way of life for unholy people like you and me through the law. 
And that's the point that the Apostle Paul was trying to drill home in Romans 3 verse 23 when he said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Like a daredevil trying to jump his motorcycle over a deep canyon, whether he's short by a foot or short by a mile, he is going to experience the same disastrous results either way. And so also for these people to whom Peter was writing, whether they were Gentiles who had lived for pleasure or whether they were Jewish believers who had been religious zealots, the law produced the same results. Death and separation from God. There is no way of life for unholy people through a law that tells us to be holy. But I'm here this morning to tell you that while that is serious, it's okay. After all, this message is not entitled, We Have No Way of Life, but that we have a new way of life. And it's that new way of life that we find as we continue on with our verses from 1 Peter. So we're going to go now to verse 17 and a very important concept that we find here. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. And there's an idea here that's very important to what comes next in this impartial judgment of the Father. You see, there is no advantage in God's eyes in wealth or race or social status. There is no advantage for the person who tried really, really, really hard to do what was right versus the person who just kind of phoned it in. The father plays no favorites here. He does not take into consideration the circumstances or the excuses that you might have to bring to the table for your disobedience. And that is true that his impartial judgment only looks at the objective product, whether you are a son of Satan or whether you are the son of God himself. So we move on to verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. In other words, God is not impressed by the things that we hold so valuable in our world and in our eyes. Gold, silver, being a majority shareholder in a publicly traded company. But there is one thing that gets his attention. And it is this perfect, this precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You see, that word holy is still right at the center of all of this. But it is not the holiness of my life that I try and fail to bring to the table anymore. Rather, it is the holiness of Christ's life that is at the center of it. And I want you for a moment to really try to wrap your minds around this when you consider, again, that impartial judgment of the Father. Whereas you and I will often pick and choose which parts of God's will are really important to keep, Jesus picked and chose all of his Father's will, and he did it all the time. We can be masters at finding excuses for our disobedience, but Jesus knew that there was never an excuse for disobedience. We pat ourselves on the back when we keep our attitudes and our thoughts from becoming words and actions. But Jesus was the son who was pure all the way down to every attitude of his beating heart like he never even woke up on the wrong side of the bed in the morning. Maybe I can use a picture here to help illustrate this purity. Um, That big old rock that you see there is called the centenary diamond. Weighing in at 273.85 carats, it is the largest cut diamond of its color anywhere in the world. Its most recent evaluation, valuation that I could find was somewhere in the ballpark of $100 million for that little rock. Now, the centenary diamond 
is the sort that jewelers would consider to be flawless, which means that even under a 10 times magnification, there are no observable inclusions. There are no imperfections or impurities that they can find. But do you know what happens if you keep on increasing the magnification beyond 10 times? You know what you're going to find? They're there. They're very tiny, but those flaws are there. And so no diamond or any precious gemstone is ever actually, truly flawless. Even an incredible one like that. But even if we were to aim an electron microscope at the gem of Jesus' life, you would find absolutely nothing but pure holiness from beginning to end. He indeed was the perfect son who was perfect in every way. And that means that there is a currency that has value. It's not found in the worthless things of this world, not even in all of those things combined. But it is found in that holy blood of the Holy Son. And do you know what's even more incredible? Is that God has chosen to spend this rare and valuable currency on us. Let's finish our verses here and then we'll bring this home. He, so this son, was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Even before the creation of the world, he was that holy son. And it is that holiness, that perfect life that has now been revealed to the eyes of mankind in that person of Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, who came for our sake to spill that precious blood on the cross of Calvary as the payment for your sin and my sin and for the sin of this whole world in order to redeem us, to buy us back from all of our unholiness and from our own self-made condemnation. And what's more, then he rose again on Easter morning in order to give us access to a new life and a new hope and a new future. And how do these things become ours? Well, that's what brings us to our second key point today. What's the new way of life through God's Son? Be, leave. Like, you don't have to do anything. Jesus has done it all for you. We simply see it and we love him and we trust him because it's ours. There is no way of life for unholy people through the law, but that's okay because God has opened up a new way for us through Jesus Christ. Believe it. But we can't quite, quite say amen just yet. We need to kind of wrap around to the beginning here. It's important to remember who Peter's audience was here. This wasn't like Peter on Pentecost who was preaching to people who did not know and trust in Jesus. Peter was writing to people who already knew that they were unholy. People who already knew that they were saved by this precious blood of Christ. People who knew that they were not redeemed through keeping a command. And yet, the command still remains. Be holy. And that's really what brings us to our last key point today. What's the new way of living as God's children? Be holy. God does not intend for us any longer to to go running around after all of those evil desires of our hearts as, as we did when we lived in that ignorance of God and of his will. He doesn't want us flirting around with all that unholiness, not here, not here, not here, not here, not anymore. Rather, as his children, to be 
holy, to be fixed on all his glory and all his will all the time and with all of ourselves. Now, some of you might be thinking, hmm, the new way sounds an awful lot like the old way. And yes, while we are using those same two words, there is one major, major difference here. Yes, God still sets the standard extremely high for his people. And yes, he is still very serious about our attaining to it. He still does not accept any excuses and gives no passes for disobedience. And he never settles for holy enough from his children. But before that drives you either to despair or complacency, remember the most important component of this command, which is that be holy does not begin with you anymore, but with Christ whose precious blood covers over all those sins, not only of your past, but also of today and tomorrow alike. So that even in our shortcomings and even in our flaws, even when we disobey as we strive to live as his holy children, we have that voice of the risen Lamb Jesus right there speaking to us and saying, You are holy. For it is my holy blood which has made you so. Now get up, forgiven, and go be who I have called you to be. Amen. We will continue now confessing our Christian faith using these words of the Apostles' Creed that that Christians have been uh, confessing together for centuries. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We will continue now by collecting our offerings of thanksgiving for our God and for the work of his church. Again, if you have that green connection card filled out, please put that into the offering plate as that comes past you. In our prayers today, we have a couple of anniversaries to give thanks for. Uh, Rich and Judy Preby celebrating their 52nd anniversary and Phil and Barb Schlafer celebrating their 58th. And I believe both of those anniversaries are falling on tomorrow? Tomorrow. Okay. Um, We also have a prayer uh, asking God to keep in his hands Stuart and Patricia Arnold, both of whom were hospitalized this past week. And then also a prayer for the called workers of Bethany and our shepherd in carrying out their ministry for God's kingdom. After that, we will continue then with the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father and everlasting God, When we were steeped in our sin and unrighteousness, and all of us were a far cry from the holy life you expect of the people you created, even then you sent us your Son to be our Savior. We praise and thank you for the blood that was poured out for us on the cross, as well as that resurrection to life, which guarantees that we ourselves are raised to new life. And not only sometime in the future, but right now this very day. In this new life to which you have called us, we ask for your strength, wisdom, love, and guidance to live as your holy people. Drive from our hearts all evil desires and every inclination to return to that ignorance in which we once lived. May we now give you glory in all that we say, think, and do. Lord God, we also thank you for the years of marriage you have given both to Rich and Judy as well as to Phil and Barb. We ask that you would be with them now as you have been in the past, as they continue to center their marriages around their faith in you. Keep them always rooted in your word as they walk one another heavenward toward that final marriage feast of the Lamb. 
Please also hold Stu and Pat in your healing hand as they battle against illness. By your will and powerful word, your son Jesus healed the lepers and made the lame walk again. We ask that if it be your will, God, you would bring full healing to their bodies and that you would grant them a return home soon. Even more than this, please fill Stu and Pat with the comfort of your promises so that they will know with confidence that you are with them, loving them and looking out for them wherever they may be. Almighty Father, please also bless me and my fellow called workers at Bethany and our shepherd. Give us all a spirit of love, wisdom, humility, and cooperation as we seek to serve the sheep of your congregation, as well as all those little lambs whom you have put into our charge to care for and with whom to share the gospel. May you use the work of our hands to bring many to faith who do not yet know you and to strengthen the faith of all those who have been entrusted into our care. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our living Savior, who also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord your God with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. close this morning with our final hymn, Abide With Me.